All right, thanks James and Allie for leading us in passionate worship of God. Love that. Hey kids, I'm telling you I'm saying that. I say hey kids and they just leave. All right, there we go. You're off to Sunday school. Thanks for being here. Yeah, high five on your way out. That's awesome. Um, excited to have our kids here. Excited to have our children's ministry workers. Loving them, sharing Jesus with them. So thank you for that. Hey, as I think through this I3 campaign that we've been drilling into you, I want to share with you a resource that we have at the back. Um, it's a book that's titled, The Gospel Comes with a House Key. And I've had it back there before, and I, I've put it back out there just as we continue to stress this idea of reaching out to those around us. And again, a title is, The Gospel Comes with a House Key, Practicing Radically Ordinary Hospitality in Our Post-Christian World, uh, written by a lady who uh, was a professor of English and women's studies at Syracuse University, and found Jesus. And she found Jesus because a uh, pastor's wife decided to invest in her and start inviting her over to dinner um, and to talk about Jesus. And through that, again, hospitality coming with a house key, inviting people into their home, uh, she came to know Jesus and now is a passionate follower. And so I want to encourage you, if you would love to read, this is her story, and it's got some great examples in here about how we can practice this same type of gospel hospitality. It's a trait that we want to have here at Calvary Parkside. We want to have, uh, as part of uh, what we're about, we want to be a church that practices gospel hospitality among many traits, right? We're, we're on this uh, journey here walking through some traits uh, here that we want embedded in our culture at Calvary Parkside. We're calling this series Remembering Our, Remembering Our Identity. And we're week three of this series and we're looking at, these, we're looking at, at five because there could be 20 traits. Let's be honest, right? I just shared one, gospel ho- hospitality, right? And I could, I could share more traits with you. But what we've done is we've narrowed it down to five. Five that we really want our church to focus on what we want to be known for, what we want to be about. And these are five traits that Jesus modeled for us while he was here on earth. And we believe that they should be woven into the very fabric of everybody who calls himself or herself a follower of Jesus. And then again, we especially want these to be embedded into the culture of Calvary Parkside. Right? We want our church to be known as a community of Christ followers who practice gospel unity, are driven by prayerful dependency, display loving generosity, live with joyful humility, and model missional urgency. Those are the five traits. And in week one, we looked at that trait of gospel unity, right? What, what is it that unifies us? What is it that draws us together? What common core conviction do we share and we talked about the idea that it's the gospel it's Jesus it's that Jesus came and he he uh, died and he rose and he's coming back and he preached this message of redemption and salvation and this this kingdom of God and that really is what unifies us and drives us to then go out and share that right we want that to unite us we don't want to be united by preferences personal desires um, you know voting things, right? We, we don't want to be united by any of that. We want to be united by the gospel of Jesus. And then last week, James walked us through the importance of a life built on prayerful dependency, that idea of being connected, staying connected to God, because that's what Jesus did. Good enough for Jesus, good enough for us, right? I mean, I, if, if you look at his time here on earth, as he walked, he always let people know, I'm about my father, I'm about God. This isn't about me. This isn't about who I am. This is about God, my Father. And even in the garden, Gethsemane, he's about to give his life. He prays, hey, I really don't want to do this, but it's not about me. It's about your will and what you want done. And so we talked about the importance of maintaining that connection, that personal connection with God through prayer. And this morning we're going to look at the trait of loving generosity. Loving generosity, which may sound a lot like gospel hospitality, but it, it, it isn't. It, it is different. Because what we're going to talk about is loving generosity amongst ourselves. 
right? Gospel hospitality is what we can do with the world and how we can bring them in and share the love of Jesus with them. But this morning, we're going to talk about loving generosity among ourselves, right? Kind of, again, playing on that, that idea of unity. What, what's it look like for us to love as Jesus loved, to love one another? So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 15. We're going to be in John chapter 15. We were there last week, we're going to be there this week. We're, we've been in John for like three months, right? Love the book of John, so we're just staying there. John chapter 15, as you're dur- turning there, let me pray for us this morning. God, we are thankful. We are thankful for your word that speaks to us, that trains us, that equips us, that unites us. We're thankful for the stories of Jesus that we can look to for guidance, for direction, for encouragement. God, just speak to us this morning through the words that you have to say to us. We love you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, John chapter 15, verse 9. Let's just, let's just read together. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you, right? He's passing down the same love that he's experienced from his Father. Now remain in my love. Now, verse 9 is a continuation of this idea of, of the vine and the branches and abiding. And so he's continuing that. Remain in my love. Verse 10. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Right? So keep His commands. So what's the command? Verse 12. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this. To lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command, right? So now he's saying, listen, I'm about to die for you, right? And that's what we are to do for one another, to lay down our life for our friends. Verse 15, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. Why? For everything that I learned from my father, I've made known to you. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. So that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Then he's going to repeat that command again in verse 17. This is my command, love each other. Love each other. Francis Schaeffer, famous pastor, theologian, created this term, the mark of a Christian. What, what is the mark of a Christian? What should we look for? to to see if someone identifies as a follower of Jesus. And Francis Schaeffer believed the most important trait is love. Because love lets us know that someone has been transformed by the gospel. They've been transformed themselves by God's love. And so they are reciprocating that. They're showing that same love that was shown to them. And love is, is spoken about all through the New Testament. 1 John 4, 8 reads this. Whoever does not love God does not know God. Why? For God is love. It's a key trait. We're here today because of God's love. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and God chose to remove them, it was out of love. And as he continued to pursue them, it was out of love. The nation of Israel with all their ups and downs that they went through. God never gave up on them. He pursued them out of love. And he pursues us today because of his great love for us. God is love. And I believe that's the mark of a Christian. But it's not just our love for God. But it's also our love for others. It's a love for God that produces a love for others. And First Corinthians, I'm sorry, in Galatians 5, right? We have those fruits of the Spirit. Love, is, love tops that list. Love is the top of that list, right? But the fruits of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, right? But love is right there at the top. First Corinthians 13, right? We like to call this the love chapter, 
right? The famous wedding chapter that's read at probably any Christian wedding you've been to, even non-Christian weddings will read 1 Corinthians 13, where it says, and this, you don't have all these words up on the screen, so you have to pay attention, maybe actually open your Bible. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, right? If I speak like angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, Paul writes, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, right? Taking one for Jesus, I'm a martyr. But do not have love, I gain nothing. And then drop down to verse 13. He talks about love, and then verse 13 says, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But he ends this with this phrase, But the greatest of these is love. Again, I would argue, like Francis Schaeffer did, that love is the most important indicator that a person has been transformed by the gospel. Now, we don't rank these family traits, but this one, if I had to put them in order, could be right at the top one. I right, practicing loving generosity as the mark of a Christian. A lot of times I think we fall into traps of creating our own traits of what we, uh, as we're looking at people and thinking, hey, I wonder if, he, I wonder, I wonder if he's a Christian. Right? I wonder if he's a follower of Jesus. And so sometimes we'll listen to how they talk. Right? What, what, what are they talking about? What language do they use? How do they dress? Right? That, that's sometimes what we use. I remember, I remember growing up, right, we, we had these traits, right, that were, that were placed on us or that you were taught, right, that, that you know, this is, this is what Christians do. This is how Christians live. Right? I remember uh, we, had to cu- we had to cut our hair in high school, right? We had the rule, your hair couldn't touch your collar, Right? Apparently, Christians don't have long hair, I guess. Right? I don't know. I, 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 never figured, I never understood that one, but you could not have long hair. And Christians absolutely did not have tattoos. Right? Better cover up, cover up those pre-Jesus tattoos right? when you become a Christian because we don't defile our body like that. Women, okay? don't think of wearing more than one earring. Okay? If you're able to wear earring, earrings at all, right? Because you're poking holes again, you're defiling. You know, go back to Leviticus, right? You're defiling if you pierce your ears. Right? Wear makeup, right? Wear inappropriate clothing, right? All these, all these traditions, all these traits that were used to determine if someone was a Christian. How do you vote? Because, uh, I mean, Christians all vote Republican, right? I mean, that's, that, that's how it was. But for the disciples here, Jesus is letting them know that it's not about the music you listen to. Right? It's not about the size of your Bible or the translation of your Bible. Right? It's not about any of that. But Jesus is saying here that the signs of a true Jesus follower is one who practices loving generosity, right? Love that has transformed them, a love for God and love for others. That's what Jesus commands, right? So it's one of the most often repeated commands, if not the most often repeated command in the Bible. We're instructed over 50 times in the New Testament alone, right, to love one another, Right, and that, again, that's just in the New Testament. Matthew 22, right? Jesus is approached and asked this question. Hey, well, well, what's the greatest command? Just, get, just boil this whole Jesus following thing down to one thing. What, what do I do? What am I supposed to be about? Where should I put all my energy? And Jesus simply says this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then he adds to it, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. 
Now, I know we're talking about loving generosity, but I'm trying to, I'm trying to lay groundwork here, right, for the importance of love in one's life. The importance of love even for God, right, because God is love. The importance of love throughout Scripture. In fact, D.A. Carson, commentator, he's a commentator, wrote this about the importance of love in the life of every Christian. He said, no amount of good works, no amount of good works, wisdom, discernment, patience, disciplined doctrine can ever make up for lovelessness. In fact, today, um, our children's director, Melanie, she's, you may know she's not here or wasn't here in the beginning. She's home. She's sick. You can pray for her that she gets better soon. And so we were scrambling this morning trying to figure out what to do with children's ministry. And so I, I pulled our children's workers together. I said, you know what? Here's, here's what I want you to do this morning. Here's what I didn't say. Hey, you know, here's a Bible lesson. You need to teach this and read it. Just love our kids. First and foremost, hug our kids. Love our kids. Read them a Bible story, sure, but love them. Because they will learn to love God by how we love them. So that's why I told our children's workers, don't get stressed out. Okay, now I did give them some Bible options, right? But first is to love, because as D.A. Carson writes, it's hard to overcome lovelessness. It's hard to overcome when we hurt people. It's hard to overcome that. Jesus emphasized again this commandment in verse 12 of here of John 15, our opening passage. He says, this, my commandment is to love each other as I have loved you. And then he goes on to say this about the way we are to love one another in verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And then he concludes with the command, love one another. So if you, if you take nothing away from this morning, hopefully you've gotten this. Okay, because I've emphasized it. I've repeated it. Kind of like Jesus repeated this. I repeat it to you. We are to love one another. We are to love one another generously. Generously. Now, John 15, this is a part of, I, I've talked about this before. This is, uh, uh, is what we call the upper room discourse. Right? There's several chapters involved in this upper room discourse where Jesus, he's in the upper room, he's the last supper, right? He's washing his disciples' feet and he's giving them his final words of instruction before he goes to the cross. What does he really want his disciples to know about before he leaves them? Well, he's talking about it here. He's talking about loving one another. So, but why? Why at this point is the emphasis on love? Because Jesus knew he knew that once he left them, that love and unity was going to be the hardest thing for them to maintain. And he also knew that it was the only way for them to maintain an adequate witness to a world that was going to hate them, that was going to seek to persecute them, that was going to seek to invalidate the message, the life of Jesus. And the same is true for us today. That's why this is one of these traits, one of these five traits that we want us to value, to uphold, to embed in the life of our church. This idea of loving generosity. Because actually, in, in, in honesty, I, I think the Great Commission, right, that Matthew 28, go ye, there, go ye therefore into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all things, and lo, I am with you always, even into the end of the world. I, I don't really believe that necessarily the Great Commission begins there in Matthew 28. We call that the Great Commission, but I don't know that the, the, the idea, the concept actually started there. I think it actually starts here in the upper room. After he washes the disciples' feet. And he begins laying out this profound game plan. As he says, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to leave you. And where I'm going, you can't follow me. Right? Even though you want to, you can't follow me. And I'm going to go and I'm going to die. Right? And someday I'm going to come back. In the meantime, I need you to do one thing. Love. 
love. That's the, that was his plan. That was his plan for reaching the world. Love one another as I have loved you. Turn just one page over, depending on your Bible, John, to John 13. John 13, verses, verse 34 and 35, he says, A new command I give to you. Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Why? Verse 35. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Again, the same command that Jesus gave in John 15. We are to love one another. If we were to take time to unpack how Jesus loved, right, we would see two things. First of all, that Jesus loved unconditionally. Jesus loved unconditionally. I mean, we see this throughout his interactions, whether it's the blind man, the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, the disciples and others. I mean, he was unconditional in his love and acceptance of. But not only that, his love was generous. His love was unlimited. Right? It was limitless, generous love. That's what he modeled. We like to talk about the unconditional love of Jesus. I want to talk again this morning about the generous love of Jesus and what that consisted of and what he wants it to, cons- to be, how that he wants that to be modeled by us. And it's all found here in John 15. So let's go back now. Let's walk through John 15 beginning in verse 12. And let's pull out, I want to pull out some characteristics of what it looks like to practice loving generosity, to have that trait of loving generosity. Uh, Verse 12, again, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. And how do I do that? Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. So that first aspect of loving generosity that Jesus modeled for us is that loving generosity is sacrificial. Loving generosity is sacrificial. Right, go over to uh, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, verse 2. It says this, oh well, verse 1. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children. And what was God's example? Walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Loving generosity is sacrificial. The ultimate love that we can show to each other, again, not the world, I'm talking about us right now, right? This is loving generosity within us. This is loving one another here at Calvary Parkside. The ultimate example of how we show loving generosity to one another is a willingness, a willingness to give higher priority to the life of someone around us than your own. Giving higher priority to someone else's life than your very own. Now, let's be realistic. Let's be realistic. You and I will probably never be called to give our physical lives for someone in this room. Odds are, right, that will not happen. But what we may be asked to do is to give up our lives in small ways, day by day, Rather than run grand gesture, we may be asked to give up our time, our talent, our treasure, our comfort for someone in this room. It always amazes me, it always amazes me when I prepare a message and are prepared to preach and I'm wondering, you know, hey, I wonder if there's some good examples that I could share. And God just says, great, yeah, I, I, I got one for you, right? So he did that. This beginning, this past Friday, we, Rose and I, our home was invaded. Can I use that term? By 11, well, no, I'm sorry, nine people. We currently have 11 people living in our house. 11 For the next eight days, we are going to have 11 people living in our house. Eight. Count that. Eight. 
Okay, I'm gonna, I just want to let that sink in. So what I've discovered over the last 36 hours right, is the need to practice loving generosity through sacrificial giving. Such things as sleeping on the couch. Right? Giving up my television. Let me say that again. Giving up my television. Right? The food I enjoy. Right? Be able to just come and go. Right? Sacrificing. For the good of another. Now someone shared earlier, I shared that to someone and someone earlier said, well, at least you're still in the house. <laughs> you may be on a couch, but you're in the house. Okay? You, didn't have, you weren't asked to pitch a tent in the back, right? Well, that may come. I may, I may do that on my own. I may not be asked to do that. Right? Loving generosity is sacrificial. So as you, again, leave this morning, I want you, as you have conversations with people, be be looking for ways that you can sacrifice for one another. And it's hard, right? Because loving generosity, living, uh, living out this loving generosity in a, in a sacrificial way means that we have to constantly focus on the needs of others. And that's hard. Because it's so much easier to focus on my own needs and to get caught up in my own wants and my own desires. But here, Jesus is saying to his disciples, I need you to be willing to sacrifice for one another. A second aspect of loving generosity that's found here in John 15 is that loving generosity is relational. Loving generosity is relational. Verse 15, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. I hope that one of the marks of our church is that we're friends. Right? We don't just attend the same church. We don't just walk in the door and sit down and say hi to each other and we have this little meet and greet time and that's it. That's I hope, we're, I hope our relationships are deeper than that, right? We have, that, we have this core value of connecting with one another authentically. My hope is we, we, we're making deep, authentic, relational connections because that shows love. And not only that, as he talks in there, I, you're my friend because I share with you. Jesus called them friends because he was sharing with them what God was asking of him, what God's business was. And so hopefully you're doing that same thing. You're sharing with one another how God is working in your life. What God's telling you. How God's teaching you. How God's molding you. William Barclay does a great job of explaining what Jesus meant by this, this moment where Jesus called his disciples friends. He says this. He says in the first century or in the second century there was a select group called Friends of the King. Right, or friends of the emperor. And at all times, these friends, they had access to the king. In fact, they even had the right to come to his bedchamber at the beginning of the day. And what he'd do is, uh, when they'd come in, he would share with them what he had going on for the day. Right, I'm the king, and here's, here's what's on my kingly agenda for today. And he'd share that with his friends. The friends of the king were those who had the closest and most intimate connection with him. And this is what Jesus meant when he told his disciples, you are now my friends. You have a close, intimate connection with me and with my Father. And the same is true of us. We have a close, intimate relationship with Jesus, and he wants us to have that same intimate, close relationship with one another as we do life together, as we confide in one another. In fact, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. I, I, I love this verse. So we cared for you. So we cared for you because we loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. So what are you doing to share your life with one another? 
What are you doing to share your life with one another? So again, loving generosity is sacrificial. Loving generosity is relational. But loving generosity also shows initiative. Right? It shows initiative. Verse 16 there of of John 15 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. Right? This is a humbling verse when, when, when you read it. And think about the fact that God chose you and God chose me. And all he chose us, he appointed us. God took initiative to pursue us. God chose initiative to send his son to the cross to die for us. God chose initiative to give us the Holy Spirit, to guide and to lead us. God, 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 God did, God did, God did, God moves, God moves. God's constantly taking initiative in our lives, and he wants the same of us. He wants us to take the initiative in showing love to others and reaching out to them and not running out the door on Sunday mornings. Not rushing in late, leaving early, right? Not calling one another, not checking in. He desires that we take initiative in loving one another. And then finally, the last part of verse 16, loving generosity produces fruit. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Now, what kind of fruit does loving generosity produce? What kind of fruit does loving generosity produce? Well, there's many. There's many. But I think Jesus gives us perhaps the most valuable fruit of our love for one another back in verse 35 of John 13 when he says by this by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another you see this statement verse 35 it reveals the effect that our love for one another will have on the world because as D.A. Carson said we can I mean, we can be conservative in our theology. We can defend, and we do. We defend the authority and inerrancy of Scripture. Right? The truth of the gospel. We honestly believe that we should worship God passionately. James talked about this last week. We absolutely believe in the value of prayerful dependency. And we can be relentless in our pursuit of making Jesus non-ignorable. And the same was true of the disciples, right? They had, all, they had it all. They had, I mean, they spent three years with Jesus. They'd seen it all. They'd heard all. They had the Sermon on the Mount in there. I mean, they'd heard it live. They knew the truths. They knew the doctrine. They knew the gospel. They knew heaven was coming, the kingdom of God. But it's interesting. Jesus goes on in verse 18, and we won't take time to read it, but he goes on in verse 18 of John 15 to tell the disciples that all of that is not going to persuade the world. They're still going to hate you. They're still going to persecute you. You are still going to experience hatred and persecution at the hands of a cynical world. And so that's why he says, this is my command, love each other. The church needs to be a loving church for a dying culture. As I, close, as I close, let's go back up to the upper room, right? That upper room discourse where Jesus has just delivered this new command to his disciples, the command to love one another. And I'm sure as, as they've, heard, they've heard all of this, right, that Jesus is leaving them, that they can't go, right, that they need to love one another. I mean, I'm sure they're reeling. They're, a little, they're, they're confused. They're, they're unsettled. They haven't connected all the dots yet. But Jesus, again, issued this command because he knew that in his absence, they would need the support of one another. Because while, uh, while he was here, while he was with them, no one doubted. Listen, no one doubted that they were followers of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was standing right next to them. 
right? They followed him everywhere for three years. And so people would look at James or, you know, Matthew, John, right? In fact, even Peter, right? Remember when Jesus is hanging on the cross and there's a, there's a girl, you know, by, sitting by a fire and she looks at Peter and says, hey, you're one, of, you're, one of, you're one of those Jesus followers. How did she know that Peter was a Jesus follower? Because he had been with Jesus. It wasn't how Peter lived his life. He was guilty by association. But Jesus is about to leave. So now, how is someone going to know that Peter was a follower of Jesus without Jesus standing right beside him? Jesus says it. It's clear and plain. They will know you by your love. They will know you by your love for one another. That's why Jesus, it, he, he just, he, I mean, he really honed in on this. He impressed on them the need for them to love one another. And I think the same, the same is true of us. We don't have Jesus here. If, if I could bring Jesus down physically, I would love that. I would love for you, I say this all the time, I would love for Jesus just to show up. It would answer so many questions and it would silence so many doubters. But he doesn't. So now what? Again, all we can do is be faithful in our walk, follow him as he commands, and love one another, right? Love the Lord your God, first greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God, and the second, love one another. Love your neighbor. So what does this look like at Calvary Parkside? Because I've given you, you know, an umbrella, right, of love, sacrificial, relational, right, intentional, shows initiative. What do I, what, what do I want us to look like here? What, what actually, how do I want this to be practiced? Well, let me give you a couple. First of all, I think the best way we can show loving generosity to one another is through encouraging one another. Encouraging one another. It's huge. And I'm not good at this. I'll be honest. Right? I, get, I, I get caught, right? I've said, shared this before where I'm moving. And I don't take time to stop and say, man, just thanks. Thanks for helping in the kitchen. Thanks for cleaning up. Thanks for taking the offering. Right? Thanks for leading work. Just thank you. We don't do enough. I don't do enough of that. I don't know if we do enough of that. I want to be a church that's known as an encouraging church. So I've got something out there to help you. Okay, we've got, again, resources back there at the next step table. It's a book called The Relentless Encourager by Mark Halleck. Mark Halleck is the president of Calvary Family of Churches, senior pastor of Calvary Inglewood. You're actually going to hear him preach both uh, on, we're going to stream a service here in a couple weeks. You're going to hear him preach. He's going to be here live in, in a month. Okay, but he wrote a book called The Relentless, Relentless Encourager. And let me tell you why I believe he wrote this book. He may have a different reason. But as I've heard the story of a church that had like 20 people left, 25 people left in it, was about to shut their doors, were weeks away, he shares what saved that dying church. I mean, yes, it was Jesus. But he also said it was two things. We preached the gospel and we loved one another. And the rest is history 350 people later constant baptisms people coming to know jesus because of the gospel and love because of the gospel and encouragement encouragement is love spoken right? encouragement is love spoken i mean just try it and see how people come alive when you encourage right how they they light up so let's be a church that encourages be available be available. Encourage is love spoken. Availability is love acted out. So try to be present. I, I, I don't do this well, but I'm trying to do better. When you talk to me, I try to be present. Right? Because my mind and your mind, you may do this, right? Your mind is, is on like eight different things you need to do. When someone's talking to you about a need they have in their life or about something exciting that's going on, do your best to be available, right? To pay attention, to, to sense where God might be calling you to love, to serve, to pray for them, to meet with them. 
right? To go out to lunch with them, to go have coffee with them. Right? Let's, let's be a family of God that is available to one another. And then finally, <laughs> this might be the toughest one, forgive those who have hurt you. Forgive those who have hurt you. So here's what we're going to do right now. I want you to go to the person that has hurt you and no. <laughs> but forgive those who have hurt you. Ephesians 4, 32. I think we have it up on the screen. Possibly. No, nope. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving one another just as in Christ God forgave you. And then I read this earlier. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love. Love or forgiveness equals love. When we forgive, we're showing how much we love someone. So let's unite together in our desire to pursue loving generosity, to be a laboratory in which God's people grow in love. Why? Because Jesus commanded it. Right? A new commandment I give to you, to love one another. My command is this, love each other. This is my command, love each other. I mean, I can keep going, right? Jesus was like a broken record. But he knew the value and the importance of love. So again, I've got, I've got this relentless encourager book out there. There's about 20 of them, so maybe one per family, one per couple, but would encourage you to, to read that. Let me pray for us. God, we are humbled to know that you love us unconditionally, but also generously. God, your love never ends. We can't run away from your love. As far as the east is from the west, God, that's how far you're, that's how much you love us. God, help us to grow in this idea of loving one another as you have loved us. God, help us to look at those areas in our lives where we struggle to love. God, help us to grow. God, thank you for this church, God, that I do believe loves one another, practices loving generosity. And God, I, my prayer is the world sees that and wants to be a part of, of this, wants to learn more about why we love. And it, it's because of you. It's because of you and your love for us. God, we do love you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.